um, where the first route, come on, Penn, is if I gave you something like this from one to five, and I gave you six times dx, where you just had a constant right here, and you could take that constant. It's a little bigger for you guys. You could take that constant, multiply it by the change in x, which is between one and five of four, and this would have a value of 20. So if you ever come across that, which you will at some point in time, we can still just do it with that product. The other way that we have done it is using the idea of an area. So that's what I want you to do here. Using the idea of an area, find the value of the following integrals. So when we integrate a curve, what we're finding is the area that that curve and the x-axis accumulate in between it. So for this one, since I want you to go from 0 to 4, then we would just turn this into a triangle and figure out what the area of that triangle would be. That would be what? 4 and 8 is 32. Cut that in half. This would have a value of 16. Now, value area would be the same in number 1 because all that area is above the x-axis. Number 2, you remember value is the net change. So as we now go from a negative 1 until 5, this is what, one, two, three, four, four. So this is a four by four. So this triangle that's above the x-axis has an area of eight. The triangle that's below the x-axis has an area of two. And since it is below the x-axis, we give that a negative value. And since we are again finding this, the value of the integral eight plus a negative two would be a six. All right, so that's where we last left off when we were dealing with definite integrals. What we then jumped to was the idea of an antiderivative. So in number three, I'm now asking you, how could the antiderivative, because recall how, let me just quiz on this, that integral symbol also means we can find an antiderivative. So how could we use that antiderivative idea now in numbers one and two to find the exact same values that we found when we were dealing with the area? So what I'm alluding to is, come over here, so we just got done with a whole bunch of there are no limits, and we talked about how that's an antiderivative. So let's say we took this antiderivative, you get 2x squared over 2, which is just x squared. Oops. Don't worry about your plus c at this point. We're going to get to that in due time here today. But just right now, write that antiderivative as x squared. What we didn't have last time was the idea of an antiderivative. But if we now look at our limits, notice how we have this function, x squared, and then we have limits of 4 and a 0. What could we do with those two things now, the antiderivative and our limits, that would give us the exact same value of 16? All right. So, Carter, you got your hand up. What do you think? Uh, you can plug in both the x and then also the 0 for the x and then the two values together. Good. Uh, I've got to turn you up so people in here can hear you. Yeah, so what he said is plug in the 4 for the x squared here. So if I did 4 squared, and then he said plug in the 0 and square it, and then he said we could add those together. All right, does that give us our 16 that we have? Yeah, all right. So now let's see if that same idea would work over in number two. So let's find the antiderivative of 3 minus x. So we would get 3x minus x squared over a 2. Carter wanted a, he said put the 4 in and then the 0. 4 was our upper limit, 0 was our lower limit. So if Carter's method is going to work, we're going to plug in the upper limit first. So in this case, that's a 5. And we get 15 minus 25 halves. And then we plug in our negative 1. So that would be what, negative 3 minus 1 half. And then he said we're going to add those guys together. And if this is correct, we should get a 6. Oof, some fraction work here. So this is what, 15 is 30 halves, so this should be 5 halves. That's what this one would evaluate to be. This one would be what, uh, negative, negative 7 halves divided by 2. So if we now add those guys together, like we did in that previous problem, that should give us a negative 2 over 2, which is a negative 1. Is that what we got by using our area? No. So we're really, really close. 
let's revisit over here. What's another thing we could do with these two guys to get the 16 again? Yeah, go ahead, Carter. We can subtract. Yeah, wouldn't subtraction have also worked over here for number one? So if we would have subtracted these, that would give us a 16. So if we now kind of explore that idea over here, so let's change this plus into a minus. So minus, minus. Now we would end up getting minus a negative 7. So we would get 12 over 2. That now does give us the 6 that we got with our area. Okay. So as these now become a little more complicated, because not every one of them is going to give us a geometry shape like this triangle or these two triangles, we can now rely on the antiderivative to figure out the value of any integral we want. We want the antiderivative. Notice this is our upper limit gets plugged in first, then we plug in our lower limit, and then we're going to subtract those. And that's largely what we put into words down here. So you can write that here if you want. We're going to define it formally here when it says evaluating a definite integral limit. But that's pretty much what this is now saying. So if you go to where it says evaluating this definite integral, you're going to see if I want f of x, and I want the integral of that or the antiderivative of that. Notice how the lowercase f becomes a capital F. That's just indicating that we've taken the antiderivative. And then I want that new function evaluated at b. b is your upper limit, just like Carter had said. Then you're going to evaluate that function at the lower limit. And then we now know that we are subtracting those two values together. And then voila, whatever that spits out is our answer. Couple things now in this one that we want to now be aware of. Like we just talked about up there, or like I told you to ignore up there, the antiderivative of 2x is x squared, but we do get this c. Don't think that the c is no longer valid and that what we were doing before wasn't something that we needed to do. Here's what's going to happen now, though. If this is our antiderivative, add this behind also, because there's no way on my math type that I could actually put this in. But after we've taken our antiderivative here, just like we did a while ago with the implicit differentiation, put that little vertical evaluation bar and then put your A below it and your B above it. That's how we're going to do every one of these antiderivatives. So that's just indicating that we've now found the antiderivative and we're going to evaluate it over the interval of A to B. We know we're supposed to plug in the upper limit first. So this just got plugged in. That's where the B squared plus C comes from. Then we know we got to subtract, and then I'm going to take my a and plug it in a squared plus c. Well, when we do this now, wouldn't these c's, because the c would be the same in whatever that function would be, wouldn't those c's cancel each other out? Yeah. And since you're always going to be doing an upper limit and then subtracting the lower limit, whatever that constant was would always cancel itself out. So as long as you have a definite integral, we do not need to put the plus c. Okay, it's unnecessary, just creates more work. It's something that would always cancel out at every single one of these problems. Okay, so the plus C, we don't have to worry about if we have limits. Okay, a couple quick rules, then we'll go to the back page and knock a few of these out. One of them is, and you kind of already know this, if you think about the idea of an area, if the integral is still the idea of an area, so the area underneath this function from A to A, so like from 2 to 2, from 3 to 3, 4 to 4, you can't accumulate any area whatsoever if there is no interval. So if your limits ever end up being the same, then you're going to get a value of zero, which should be pretty easy to understand. If you look at the next one, and there is a question on the test that will test you on this idea, um, the A is implied to be our lower limit. So when we see the original one up here, the lower limit being our smaller number, it comes first alphabetically, and then B comes second. That implies A is the smaller, B is the bigger. So if we ever end up with the bigger number on the bottom, and the smaller number on top. We could if we want. We don't necessarily have to, but we can flip those so that it actually looks like it's supposed to look where the smaller number is on the bottom and the bigger number is on the top. To account for that, though, we've got to multiply by a negative one. Okay? With that, we should then be able to do these problems on the back page. So we'll hammer out a few of these. Typically, it's pretty well received. This is not terribly hard stuff because we've already done everything that we're supposed to be able to do in terms of antiderivatives. So we're first finding the antiderivative, x squared over a 2. 
what you do need to show, we put this evaluation bar behind it, and then you're going to go from two to four. So that's just saying I've now taken the antiderivative, that is the antiderivative, and we're going to evaluate it over those two limits. We now know we plug in the upper limit first, so I'm going to take my four and plug it in. So that would give me 16 halves. Take your two and plug it in, that would give us four halves. So whether you think of that as 12 over 2, or you think of that as 8 minus 2, either way that should give us a value of 6. Recall what that is giving us now. This one we could do with geometry. If I drew in the line y equals x, so through the origin with a slope of 1, if we calculated the area from 2 to 4, so this we could do with geometry if we wanted, that is telling us that there's 6 units of area in there. So don't lose sight of what this is still giving us. And that's pretty much it. So number two, same thing. We would do the antiderivative first. So x cubed over a three, we're gonna evaluate it from zero to three. So we draw a little bar behind it and evaluate from zero to three. Plug in your upper limit first, that would give you 27 thirds. Subtract, plug in your lower limit, zero thirds. So that's really just a nine. This one we couldn't do with geometry. This is the parabola y equals x squared. So what this has now told us, between 0 and 3, that's how much area we would have accumulated underneath x squared. Between that and the x-axis would be 9 units of area. Okay. As these turns into binomials and trinomials, I didn't give you any trinomials today. Just be careful with everything. Use parentheses. Just be thorough. So as we do this antiderivative, x squared over 2 minus x. My eraser to work. And then we're going to evaluate that from 2 to 5. So here I would strongly recommend use some parentheses. So you're going to take your 5 and plug it in. So use a parentheses for your upper limit. So 25 halves minus 5. And then minus, open up another set of parentheses now for your lower limit. Plug in your 2, so 4 halves minus 2. And if you can simplify these right when you plug in, feel free. I mean, they're all pretty bright people, so if we can just write that as 2 minus 2 right away. Go ahead, not a big deal. Um, so this would be what, 25 halves minus 10 halves is 15 halves. 4 over 2 is 2, minus a 2 is a 0. So our answer just ends up being 15 x. Okay. Four, antiderivatives, negative cosine. So that we should know. And then now it's up to you what you want to do with that negative. What I will generally do, if it's a, a monomial, I'm going to ignore that. It's going to avoid some double signs within the brackets. Plenty of people will just leave it as a negative cosine and do it that way. But I'm going to pull the negative out, and then I'm going to treat that cosine as a positive cosine. So I'm going to do cosine of pi over 2 minus the cosine of 0. If you want to leave the negative with the cosine, not terribly difficult. But I like pulling it out so we don't get too many sign changes happening inside. So whatever we get now inside, we're just going to multiply by that negative that we are ignoring currently. So pi over 2 is the top of the circle. The x-coordinate up there is 0. At angle 0, our x-coordinate is a 1, so we get a negative, negative 1, so that has a value of 1. All right. Okay, hopefully this is going reasonably well. Try 5. Usually it doesn't take too many of these to get the hang of it. Unit circle review. Okay, let's see if we got it. So we should know this now. We quiz on that idea. Antiderivative secant squared is tangent. We're now going to evaluate that from zero to pi over four. <clears throat> Plug in your upper limit, subtract, plug in your lower limit, 
And then we would just want to know on our circle, pi over four is this 45 degree angle. That actually should be the nicest of all of them. That's when your x and y are the same. Tangent, you're dividing them. So the tangent of pi over four must be a one. Tangent of zero must be a zero. So this is a nice one. Okay. Six, just like I did with the negative in the previous one, totally up to you. And this isn't too bad, especially with a zero and a negative one. But we could ignore that fraction. So if we're going to get an ugly fraction out of this, we could just ignore the four thirds and then just treat this as an x cubed. You don't have to again, but it's something to consider. It's something that's an option to you. Then all you're going to end up with is zero cubed minus a negative one cubed. So then that four thirds would just get multiplied by whatever the inside evaluates to be. So this should end up being what? Zero minus a negative one which is a plus one, so this should get a value of four thirds, all right? All right, seven, try number seven again. Uh, Jade, what did you do first, Jade? Okay, so Jade went ahead. She recognized that the bigger number was on the bottom. The smaller number was on the top. But if you didn't recognize that, don't change your work yet. All right, don't erase anything. Don't change anything. So we're going to multiply by that negative, she said, and then that allows us to put the one here and then the three here. And then it now looks, you know, quote unquote normal. So the smaller number on the bottom, bigger number in the upper limit. So if we do that, now we just have this negative hanging out. We'll do our antiderivative from one to three. I'm going to ignore the negative until the end. If I take my three, I get 27 thirds, which is nine. I take my one and plug it in, that would give me a one third. What is that? 27 thirds. So we should get a negative. And then inside here would have been a negative 26 thirds. So that's our answer. However, I would imagine some people didn't catch that. If you didn't catch that and you just evaluated it as we have in those previous six questions, do we get the exact same answer that we just got by flipping it? Yeah, you do. Um, so in terms of do we have to flip those? The answer would be no, because if I just plug this in now, I'm going to get one third minus 27 thirds. I'm still going to get that negative 26 thirds that we got by flipping our limits. So you don't have to flip them. Again, as we, this is day one, you're just learning kind of this idea. As we get later into the year and things get you know, a little more challenging, there are going to be times where we want to flip these or we need to flip these, but you don't necessarily have to if we're just evaluating a simple little problem like this. Okay, totally up to you. Okay, next one. Uh, here's our natural log. We should be pretty familiar with that at this point. Done a ton of those here the last week. We're then going to evaluate that from 1 to the e to the 4th. I'm going to review some things here also. Plug it in. Since those are both, you can leave the absolute values if you want, but since those are both positive, it doesn't, we don't necessarily need them when we plug it in. And then we should know that the natural log of e cancels. We should just be left with the 4. And then you should know the natural log of 1 is 0. So overall, four. All right, and then the only one that should make you think a little bit more is number 10. See what you think for number 10. Go through that, see if we can come up with that one. Oh, wait. 
was the number nine. Sorry, I had my screen moved over too far. Sorry. Yeah, keep doing number 10, I guess, since I told you to do 10. Things blown up too big here. <clears throat> So first, recognize what the antiderivative of this is. Recall, we can if we want. We don't necessarily need to. If you recognize this right away for what it is, that's totally fine. But we, if it's not something you recognize right away, we could pull that two out if we wanted. So I could take this two, put it out in front. If this is a better visual, it helps us to recognize this a little bit easier. Either way. Either way, we should, though, get an inverse sine of x. That's what we take the derivative of to get this. And then the numerator of the 2 is just our coefficient. Then we're going to evaluate that over the interval of 0 to 1 half. Plug in your upper limit. And then subtract. Throw in your lower limit. Again, I pulled the 2 out. You don't necessarily need to, but I like kind of dealing with the most simple part within the brackets as possible. So then we now need to remember how to evaluate something like this, the inverse sine of one half. So recall what we did with these. These are where we had our restricted ranges, so we need to know what quadrants, what interval these are defined at. Remember that quadrant one always works. So as long as there is a quadrant one angle that works, we don't need to be too creative and start working our way around the unit circle to find anything else. So this is simply asking, is there an angle here in quadrant one whose y coordinate, because the sine is a y, has a value of one half. And whatever angle that is should be our answer. And there definitely is, correct? All right, so the y coordinate, or the angle whose y coordinate is one half should be this guy right here. Where we go root three over two, comma, a one half. That's our 30 degree angle, which is pi over six. Minus, same thing with this, there is a first quadrant angle whose y coordinate is a zero. So right at the very beginning, one comma zero. So that is angle zero. So if you finish that off and you ended up with a pi over three as your final answer, then that's pretty good. Okay. So the new part's pretty easy, but it allows me to kind of give you some old stuff, see if you remember all these things at the same time. Let's go to number nine. I didn't want to skip number nine. I just didn't realize it was there. So antiderivative of one over x, we would have just done in the previous problem. So that's our natural log. And then we should now know the antiderivative of e to the 2x is e to the 2x divided by 2. We're evaluating that from 1 to e. Upper limit we throw in, lower limit you're going to throw in, all right, a little review of this, the natural log of E, that's our value of 1. Minus, and then I've always felt like e to the 2e should do something cool, a cancel or something, but it doesn't. You just leave it. e to the 2e over e, not much that happens there. Natural log of 1 is a 0, but we do have minus a negative e squared over 2, so that should become plus e squared over 2. Okay. And that's it. These guys real quick. I'd like to get through these and then if I can yeah, 
then we'll see where we're at. All right, so what you were given. We don't know what our functions are, but what you have is, oops, if I knew what f of x was, if we were to integrate it from 1 to 9, it has a value of a negative 1. That same function, if I were to integrate it from 7 to 9, has a value of 5. So both of those are the function f. If you go to the next one, however, it's a different function. We don't know what that function is, so we're just given the name of it. It's called h of x, and if we integrate h of x from 7 to 9, you're going to get a value of 4. And then these just test you on some of those rules that we talked about in the past and that we talked about earlier. What this is telling us, an old idea, we haven't necessarily had to do this very often. When we want to do this is when we're dealing with two different things. And even in this one, you don't necessarily need to. But the reason I'm giving you this is as a quick little refresher, we can split our integrals up as long as we are adding or subtracting. So in this case, rewrite those as two separate little integrals. Yes, Lily. Um, it, on paper, at least, it just shows x for all three of them. So you're saying that the last step oh, of x should it? actually be an h. Yeah, this definitely should be an h of x. Sorry. Yeah, so this one that I have highlighted in blue, change that to h of x. Thank you. Once we now have these two guys split up, then we can go ahead and do their values, right? Like we know what this one is. From 7 to 9 integrating h of x, or I'm sorry, f of x, so that's 5. And to integrate h of x from 7 to 9, that's the one that we just changed. That's 4, so then our answer is going to be 9. All right. And that's all we do. Uh, answer 12. See what you think for 12. 12 makes you think briefly and then that should be pretty quick if you're feeling pretty good try number 13 13 should also make you think a little bit brain teaser a little bit but not too bad All right, so we talked on the front page, if the bigger number is on the bottom and the smaller number is on top, to evaluate an integral like we did earlier, we don't necessarily have to switch it. But in a problem like number 12, we would definitely want to know this rule. Because if I want to evaluate 9 to 1, this is the one that I need to reference. This is the one that we were given that's going to allow us to answer number 12. But that goes from 1 to 9. So if I wanted to turn this guy into this one, which we do, we would want to flip these limits around so that it would become a 9 to a 1. But to account for that, we need to multiply that by a negative number. So that would then change our negative 1 to simply a positive 1. Okay, nothing crazy. But that's an instance where we would want to make sure that we understand that rule. OK, 13. We haven't done that one yet. Try 13. Because this one is not explicitly given like the first two allow us to do. So 13, you got to combine a couple of those together and then see what we think. I think they got that. How are you feeling smart? And there's really a couple different routes you could take to do this, a couple different thought processes. No brave souls.
here's how I'll explain it. And I think it's the easiest way to understand, even though it's not necessarily the idea of an area to explain it. But what you're given in this initial one is that if I go from one to nine, that I get a value of a negative one <clears throat> overall. Actually, let me put it sit down here. So that's my overall value is a negative one. What that second one is telling us, if we go from seven to nine, so if I stop now here at seven and I just kind of cover this interval, then that value is a five. And then what the question is ultimately asking, if we look at our limits, if I just want to know what's going on from one to seven, that just so happens to be the interval now that we still meet. So a couple of different routes you could take. You could just think in your head, all right, well, what value could I put right here so that if I take this unknown, add it to five, I'm going to get a negative one. That should hopefully get us to a six. That's one thought process we could go through. Or aren't we given the whole amount? So we're given the entire thing, so we're given the whole, and then we're just subtracting this part. The whole amount was the negative one. We're subtracting the part that we know of five. That should also then give us that negative six. All right. Now, only thing I'm going to give you. So make a note, pay attention. Usually we do a partner assignment on this chapter, and I'm not. We just don't have time. However. That partner assignment prepares you for a question on the on the test that a lot of people miss. And since you aren't going to be exposed to that, um, there is going to be a test question that combines these two ideas that you want to be very, very careful of. Because even when people take the, a partner assignment, a lot of people still miss this question. The idea that if we flip our limits, it's negative. What if we aren't given the functions outright, these values? Maybe we have to do an, a, a, a sum of them or a difference of those. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. Okay, know those two rules when the test time comes next week. Hopefully you have that written down and you don't forget about it. Now, 14, here's where we really want to split our integrals. <clears throat> Most of the time it's unnecessary to split our integrals. And what I mean by that again is if I pop up here to number three, we could if we wanted to in number three, and we definitely do not want to, we could write this as two to five integrating X and then subtract two to five integrating a one. It's usually not worth our time. It creates more work than is necessary, but we could if we wanted to split this up. The reason we don't want to here is we know the antiderivative of X, we know the antiderivative of one. Where it comes in handy is when we are dealing with a problem like number 14, where if I'm asking you to do this problem here, Right? So that's what we're ultimately trying to figure out. We have part of this function that we know. So I know the antiderivative of 3. That's 3x. We could actually, let me write this. Uh, we could actually, so don't necessarily write this down right now because it's not going to work for us. But just so we remember, if I did the antiderivative of a lowercase f, I could put it as an uppercase f. I could conceivably do this. Plug in the upper limit. Plug in our lower limit, and we at least get like a 3a and a plus, or 3b and a plus 3a, which starts to look like this. But these guys here, there is a chance in certain types of questions where maybe you have that information, maybe through a table, maybe through a graph, maybe I just give you those values. But in this case, I don't give you any other information that would allow us to figure out what capital F of B would equal. So while this is a valid option, it just doesn't work here. So when you see problems like this, where we know part of the function and we don't know another part, that's kind of screaming out to you that you probably want to split this up because we're going to probably have to do these in different ways to where we're going to treat this as its own problem and we're going to treat this one as its own problem. Because once those are split, don't we now know what this value is? That's what we were given right here, that if I integrate f of x dx from a to b, all right, I know what this is. That has a value of a plus 2b. Sometimes you're given a graph to figure out what those are, okay, and you'd have to do a little bit of work, but in this case, you're just flat out given what those values are. This one we can do. It's the same thing that we did in the previous 13 problems. We're now going to add, we can actually do the anti- I'm sorry, there shouldn't be an X there yet. A little carry away. 
we know the antiderivative of a 3 is going to be 3x, and then we're going to evaluate it from a to b. Plug in your upper limit, subtract, plug in your lower limit. So this is the value of the first integral. This is the value of the second integral. We want to simply add those two things together. So that would give us, what, 5b's and a negative 2a, so that we ultimately get, what, e. Okay. Okay, we're actually going to finish, I feel, with extra time almost. Weird. All right, last one. I give you this here usually to kind of finish up the note, so we still don't lose sight of what we are doing. We can definitely do this by hand. We're going to get a negative cosine of x from a negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Again, I'm going to ignore that negative so we don't get too complicated with signs. I'm going to pull it out, and then we plug in our upper limit. Subtract, plug in your lower limit. The x-coordinate at the 90-degree angle at the top of our circle is 0, minus the x-coordinate negative pi over 2 is the bottom of our circle. So instead of going up 90, we go backwards 90. So wouldn't that x-coordinate also be 0? So this integral has a value of 0. The reason I do this is so we don't lose sight of what we are finding with every single one of these problems that we have done before. It's still the idea of area. It's still how much area is enclosed by the curve and the x-axis. So we can now show that with our graphs. What I want you to do on this now, we're going to graph this. So we're going to call this negative pi over 2. Actually, don't call that negative pi over 2. Because negative pi over 2 is about 1 and a half. Oh, come on. So put negative pi over 2 right here between a negative 1 and a negative 2. And then the same with a positive pi over 2. It's about 1 and a half, so we're going to put that at pi over 2. Oh, you can even see that. Make this bigger for those in, at home or for those here. And then we're going to graph that sine of x curve. So we know sine of x goes to the origin. We go to pi over 2, and then the negative pi over 2 would be down here. Don't draw a line. Okay, we know what the sine curve looks like. It looks like this even though I did somewhat of a line. It's pretty bad. What we are still finding when we do all these integrals is the net change in the area underneath that curve. The reason we get a value of zero is because if we look at the area that we have above and then we look at the area that we have below, would we all agree that those two areas are the same? One is positive, one is negative. When we add them up, you're going to get a zero. Yes, that is why the value of the integral is a zero. That is still what we are calculating the net change in the area underneath our curve. Okay? Okay. With that, we're actually done early with a few minutes to spare. So I like these days. They don't happen anymore. Um, so with that, we're, we're done. So if you are at home, unless you had a question you want to hang out and ask, you guys can check out. Uh, have a good weekend. Then again, keep in mind when we come back, we're going to have a quiz, a test on Wednesday. All right, so just kind of file that away and make sure we're aware of that. Okay. All right, we'll see you guys. Have a good weekend.